And welcome, everybody. We're live. This is the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series, where we're bringing back the Lars Starter conversation and style with all of you live worldwide, our lovely audience who's tuning in. And they're already commenting. I think that's so cool in the JMS Live chat room we have here. You guys can comment live and uh, share that lovely and spread the sunshine. You know, our show has a lot of inspiration, great entertainment poignant conversations, and so much more for all of you. Thanks for all the comments, the Instagram messages, the tweets, the, the Facebook messages, all the posts, and for being a part of our show. We just had our epic two-year anniversary uh, on Sunday with special surprise guests, and it was really extraordinary. And we're inching on some 700 episodes. That's a lot of talking. That's a lot of levity. And we've done it with all of you. And thanks to all of the viewers for the love and the support and the kindness you express. We're working hard behind the scenes to give you the best product possible. We love doing this for all of you. Many of you said, are you just doing this during the pandemic? You know, sometimes YouTube goes crazy if you say that word too loud. So I say pandemic. And uh, was I just going to do it during this period to, you know, make people smile and connect us all? And this has grown into quite a monster. And I said, you know what? We'll just keep doing it as long as you guys are there and you're watching and you're supporting and you're sharing and you're enjoying all the amazing guests and conversations. The guests do come in from uh, Broadway and Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, and uh, inspiration, authors. Sports, as I say, uh, we really cover the gamut, and it's been really, really fantastic. We've got an amazing guest coming in from her beautiful home in Palm Springs, California, where I just asked her just a couple of seconds ago, what is the view beyond her computer? It's these gorgeous mountains and soon to be a stunning sunset. Not too bad. I'm talking about, of course, our wonderful friend Lucy Arnaz, the one and only actress, singer, Emmy winning producer yes of course daughter of lucille ball and daisy arnaz many of you know that already uh she's an icon herself she's an extraordinary person she's a gifted talent she is witty funny affable kind she likes to have a good time she's an extraordinary actress she's an amazing singer and if you have never been to any of her shows uh you got to get yourself there wherever she comes to your town whenever Get tickets and go to the show because she'll make you feel good. She plays with the audience. She entertains. She's just, you know, top talent, class act. She always has been. But uh, it, it, just seeing her in concert, seeing her in performance is extraordinary. So maybe you've seen her on television over the years. You've seen her in movies, but you've never had a chance to actually go to one of her shows. Highly, highly recommend it. She's with us here live from Palm Springs, California. It's a real honor and pleasure. Now, of course, you guys probably know she began her long career in the recurring role on the television program, The Lucy Show. And of course, at 15, she became a series regular on Here's Lucy. And she later starred in her own series, The Lucy Arnaz Show. On film, Lucy has co-starred in, of course, The Jazz Singer with Neil Diamond and Sir Lawrence Olivier, as well as starring in several made-for-television movies, including Who Killed the Black Dahlia and Down to You. On stage, Lucy created the role of Kathy in the West Coast premiere of Vanities and the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles before starring as Gidel Mosca in the first national company of Seesaw alongside Tommy Toon. Lucy's Broadway credits include many. They're playing our song, Lost in Yonkers, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, and of course, Pippin. Got a chance to see her <laughs> hanging by a thread upside down in New York with Pippin. She was amazing. Uh, it was really extraordinary. She and, of course, her husband of many years, actor, writer, Lawrence Luckenbelli, team up to form Our Luck Entertainment, which is a film and television production company, and uh, been doing all kinds of incredible work, including, uh, you probably remember, the documentary Lucy and Desi, a home movie, Emmy winning, which uh, garnered that fabulous Emmy. And during that distinguished career, Lucy has also received numerous accolades, including a Golden Globe nomination, Theater World Award, Chicago's famed Sarah Sutton's Award, and so much more. She does have um, sort of a tour that's going on. We were just talking about, is it a tour? She's got a lot of shows that she's been doing, and she's very excited to be back out on the road to be with everybody. Celebrating her life on stage, Lucy Arnaz, again, makes her Feinstein 54 solo debut, 
and I got the job, Songs from My Musical Past, from her first role at 14 at the Cheshire Cat in Alice in uh, Wonderland as the Cheshire Cat to grandmother hanging upside down on that trapeze while singing about the uh, preciousness of life in Pippin. Lucy and musical director, the incomparable Ron Abel. They offer audiences this brand new concert sharing stories and songs that Lucy has been long known for with antidotes and fond memories about her co-stars, directors, musical collaborators. She offers iconic songs and hidden treasures from some of Broadway's greatest shows and a look at the backstage magic it takes to create them. It's a wonderful evening of honoring our great American musical theater that is not to be missed. We're going to tell you about opportunities. She's going to be coming to uh, the New York area and other great locations as well. Now, Lucy and I have met on many occasions through dear friends. We've had great laughs, great op you know, opportunities for conversation. This photo I absolutely love. <laughs> it's a great one. And uh, again, she's really, really a rock star to many. And she's amazing. There's with some of our other friends, too. Uh, Sean Vonnecker, of course, there's Larry and uh, David Friedman and all of us there after a great event uh, in Connecticut. This was actually on stage, Pippin, right after she was hanging upside down. <laughs> and this actually was uh, after one of her concerts, one of my favorite. Uh, this was in Connecticut. She was performing at the Catherine Hepburn Performing Arts Center. And this was after... Look at that smile. How, how do you resist? Not mine. Look at hers. <laughs> She's amazing. She's a, a, a sweetheart on many, many levels. Everybody loves her. And uh, it's my honor to join me again. Again, if you want to comment, I see a lot of comments already here in the JMS Live uh, chat room there. So if you want to comment during the show, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would love that. That's Jim Masters TV. All you need to do is just go right there to that red button you see which looks like that, hit that, there's no cost, and you're a subscriber to the Gym Masters Show on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, that also allows you to chat in our chat room. Uh, many of you are doing that now. We'll show some of those comments during the course of our broadcast as well. We always like to make it an interactive uh, show for all of you. Uh, join me in welcoming the incomparable Lucy Arnaz, live and direct from her home, the sun is getting ready to set soon and the beautiful views in Palm Springs, California. Lucy, welcome, my friend. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Jim, I don't know what to say after that introduction. There is nothing left to talk about. You mentioned everything I've ever done in my life, it seems like. I'm honored. What a wonderful, beautifully enthusiastic introduction. And I'm I'm very flattered. Thank you. That's well, it all comes from the heart, my friend. And uh, I, I, you know, love you dearly. And as do many, and a lot of folks are commenting right now. How are you? Uh, I know it's been a little bit of a crazy time the last couple of years, and uh, you had the shows going, things were booking, and then all of a sudden everything came to a stop, and uh, you had to pull out the Parcheesi and the Monopoly for a while. <laughs> How have you been, my friend? Well, you know, during that two-year period, um, as fate would have it, we were busy working on uh, two productions. One was this film that came out this past year that Aaron Sorkin wrote uh, called Being the Ricardos, and I was co-producing, executive producing, and involved in all the script work and all the stuff for that, so that kept me busy. And Ron Howard and White Horse Pictures and Amy Poehler directed uh, a documentary on my mother and father at the same time that uh, had been brought to me several years before, but it all got into production right during COVID. So kind of wild that that was there with, so there was a lot of work and I stayed very busy locally making masks and gowns and, you know, trying to help out the hospitals and things so that there was enough PPE for everybody. And my daughter was here with her husband and my new grandson, JD. And so uh, we take, I was playing grandma you know, for real, not like the one in Pippin. And, and I, so it, it was a long two years of not doing what I do for a living. Yeah. And that was weird. I, it felt strange, you know, but um, these things happen the way they're supposed to. And uh, I'm, it was fine. You know, we got, we got through it and their two great products came out of it at the end. So which is extraordinary, the uncanny timing. You and I were talking about how it, during this time, people have been craving 
comfort and nostalgia and good music and TV shows and films and baking mm -hmm. that sourdough bread. And at the time, uh, unbeknownst to anybody, the timing of these two uh, productions was absolutely ideal and very well received too. The this this burst. I mean, it's always been there. You've lived it. You've experienced it all your life. This recent fervor and burst for our where people just can't get enough of mm -hmm. Lucio Ball, Desi Arnaz, Lucy, Ricky, all of that. What do you think that is? What is it about what they were able to accomplish and bring to all of us that still resonates today with all cultures, all generations, all backgrounds, all these years? It was brilliantly written. Let's just say that. Brilliantly conceived and constructed. Those scripts, you can't match them anywhere. Uh, that's why they still play over and over and over and over again. You have four actors who believed everything they said, even as crazy as it got. But it was brilliantly, brilliantly conceived. And nobody was really made fun of. They didn't do political humor. They didn't do put down humor. It's the kind of show you can sit your kids down in front of for four generations, with the possible exception of the fact that most people smoked in those days. We didn't know. You know, but yeah, and it was a show about love, about unconditional love. And that is, it's funny. And they were brilliant, the four of them together. But it was about uh, forgiveness and love and friendship. And that's et an no, eternal are. subject that everybody uh, craves, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And it's, some, again, something that people still, they seem to not get a, enough of. And again, recently, this this love of your parents even away from just I Love Lucy, just I can't get enough of Lucy and Desi. Uh, something that you, again, have always experienced throughout your life. But uh, mm -hmm. it's been really amazing to see all these different tributes and all these different things that have been popping up. And just the the day-to-day -day discussion about Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, um, the fascination still continues, huh? Well, it's a fascinating story. I mean, they're very interesting people who came from very diverse backgrounds and yet very similar in the struggles and the traumas that happened to them as young people and and how they could come together and create this monolith that they did is is a fascinating story it never gets old and and every couple of decades somebody wants to take a fresh look at it there's a younger group of people who are interested and uh, we've we've um, people write to me all the time and say oh thank you for keeping the flame alive and i don't do that that's not my job i have a job I sing and I dance and I act and I produce and I'm a grandmother and a wife, you know, that's my job. But I do police things and I do try to keep whatever this real estate is uh, well taken care of. I, I keep it mowed and fertilized and make sure that there's not a bunch of crap out there with their pictures on it. And and that take, that's been 35 years, you know, of doing that and uh, making decisions about should it be this, should it be that? And I, I think it's, the real estate is a good way to put it. That piece of land, that property is still worth a lot. It's still classic. It's still untouched. It's still exactly the way it was originally. And and that's and I'm proud of that. My brother and I uh, oh, do yeah. the best we can to make sure that that's true. So it's it, it just keeps going, and I'm I'm very proud. It's a good thing. How's the family doing? How is uh, Larry and the kids? How's uh, Desi? How's everybody doing lately? They're doing fine. And uh, my grandchildren are three. Two two of them are th going to be three this week and next month. And, wow. and the other one is a year old just. And that's just the best thing ever. And um, I'm happy to be back at work. My, my husband, Larry, just finished a, an autobiography that he is publishing very soon. And he's been working on that for, I don't know, seven years. It's ridiculous. It's been a long time. So he's all excited about that. My brother's fine. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And, uh, he, you know, he kind of is retired, just yeah. lives a mountain, mountain man life. And very happy to do so. They're all saying hello, and uh, they're all wishing you well. There's <laughs> a, a lot of comments coming in here. Good. Thanks, well, I'm, I'm, I'm listening, and I'll answer whatever. Is there a question out there? I'm happy yeah, to answer. Hello, and welcome, Lucy. Hello, Lovities. Happy Wednesday. I was going to say, don't get me started, but it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Like he's already run down. She's so tired. She's That's done. it. Need some water? <laughs> With my bubble glass. It looks like your show.
Yes, and we'll toast in my I Love Lucy well, mug. Change, we can change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we can certainly change the subject. I've said what I have to say, and I know everybody gets it, and I'll, I will try to uh, move on to some other subject. Beautiful home that you're in there. It looks like uh, something that's on the cover of Architecture Digest. Oh, Tell us about that wonderful paradise you have there. Oh, now my God. It's, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm very lucky in front of me. Is a great mountain range that literally there's nothing in front of me. It's almost 360 degrees, and it's on uh, Indian sacred Indian burial ground land with the mountain in front of me. So nothing can ever be built there. It's heaven on earth. I don't know how we got so lucky as to find this place. We had friends in the area, and it was kind of just one of those crazy things that I happened to see this house one day, and we walked in and went, "I don't care what we have to do. This is where we want to live the rest of our life." And we do love it. Every morning I wake up and I go, oh, God, I love it here. You know, <laughs> I mean it. I truly do. And uh, as kids, you guys went out to Palm Springs, right? Because we had a house. had a house, house out still, there. The house my dad built is still here. It's in Rancho Mirage. And um, my mother left it to my stepfather, Gary. And when he passed away, he left it to his then wife, Susie McAllister Morton. And she still lives there. And uh, we, so we spent a lot of time in the desert. Yeah. Uh, you know, during the season, uh, we went to the beach when it was summer and we lived in Beverly Hills the rest of the time for school. And then we spent a lot of time in Palm Springs. So I do have a simpatico for this area. And I, yes, it's sort of very magical and, and metaphysical about being an, among the, the Indians and the mountains and all that that represents to me. I feel like I'm part of that somehow. You know, it's hard to believe, Lucy, 70 years of I Love Lucy and over 50 years for you doing your thing. Uh, that went by in a New York minute, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> well, I, I started as such a child. But seriously, I had my, I got my SAG card, Screen Actors Guild, when I was 15. Yeah. Oh, no, actually, was I younger? Because I did a little episodic part on the show. I might have had to get one. I think that was a... They got a freebie out of that. And then uh, when I joined Here's Lucy, I think I got my first uh, social security card and my my SAG card. Mm. And and that's a long time ago, you know, and I have been able, knock wood, to make a living in this business my whole life yeah. after leaving that show. Yeah. And um, I think that's kind of fabulous. And then I haven't stayed in one area. I have diversified, as you <laughs> That amazing yeah. introduction you did. <laughs> uh, I've done all kinds of things. I've, you know, from television to the stage work to some series uh, specials, and and then moving into movies and then concerts. My concerts. I've been. It's hard to believe I've been doing just that for um, over thirty years, and and that's crazy. But it's. I love it. I love being in front of a live audience. Yeah. And I can do that in concerts, the same as being on Broadway. Yeah. Films are fun, and they're there forever. But the whole process is more tedious. It isn't as immediate. I kind of love the scariness of the high wire act of being in front of a live audience doing what I do, whether it's television with an audience or theater or concerts, you know. Yeah. And I love music. I mean, singing yeah. is a joyful, wonderful thing that I, uh, I look well, forward to every time. You had a lot of it in your house with your dad, huh? He, he did. He sang a lot. We were always surrounded by that wonderful music. And then later, even with my stepfather, Gary, he uh, it was a big music enthusiast and had a lot of great albums. I used to listen to his his albums were, you know, the, the cream of the crop. Yeah. He had the most amazing collection of, you know, the, the Mel Tormes and the Lena mm -hmm. Horns, Sammy Davis and Dean and Frank and Rosie Clooney and... So I was learning everything that was about the top 40 and the rock and roll thing on one hand, but then I would listen to this wonderful music, which was primarily American songbook and jazz and just vocalists, you know, great lyrics and singers. So I gravitated kind of toward that, I think, yeah. much more than wanting to be in the rock and roll kind of genre. And it suited it suited me fine, and I think I can, except for the Rolling Stones and a few other people, it's hard to grow old in rock and roll. <laughs> Willie Did Nelson, I could have been a Willie Nelson. You could have been a Willie Country Nelson. That Western is you can you can uh, have a career in that. Now, did you know early on that uh, you were going to delve into this business, having the influences of your parents and, and all that they accomplished around you? Was it something that you knew you were going to do? Uh, how did you? Realize well, what were some of those inspirations that pointed you in the direction of doing this work, going into the arts? 
Yeah, I talk about it in my show. I got the job. Yeah. Songs from my musical past, soon to be. <laughs> no, I um, <laughs> I actually, it started very, very, very early, I must say. I, I kind of always enjoyed the musical comedy realm. Um, you know, I, I, I saw musicals when I was a kid, like seven, eight. I saw my first musicals, The Music Man, uh, Once Upon a Mattress. And then Bye Bye Birdie came out as a film. And I saw that. And I was very shy, believe it or not, mm. believe it or not, as a child. But I would find my own little dark corner, my space, and I would put a record on and jump up on a coffee table and make believe I was on stage pretending I was those people. And I would lip sync and I would put costumes on. And then when I was about 11 or 12, I started a little group in my backyard that we also did stuff like that. But my mother built us a little stage with a light and a draw curtain. And, and I would produce these little plays and we would sell tickets live audience, right? Then I picked a high school and I because it had a good drama department and I, they did musicals. And out of that, my mother cast me on her show and we did musicals every single season, like eight or nine musicals a year uh, for six years. So all of a sudden that was kind of where I was going. And then I, I chose not to go to college because I was being asked to tour in summer stock and do regional theater. I think, well, I'll go do this for a year and then I'll go to college. But I never had the opportunity or wanted to step away from what I was doing that I was learning from and loving. And after many, many years in theater, which led back to some television and some movies, but back to theater, always back to theater. Yeah. When there wasn't enough Broadway stuff happening or I didn't want to be away from my kids that long, I started putting together a club act because I really wanted to be in front of a big band like my dad and, and experience that girl singer thing. And that has just been amazing. That mm. has changed my life. And yeah. I think that's where I always really belonged. Is there a preference? Do you love musical theater um, more? I do. Than, at this yeah. age, I'm as old as the I Love Lucy show. So at this age, <laughs> theater, musical theater is my favorite thing. Yeah. But I have a husband who's a couple of years older than I am. And I have grandchildren and I have a beautiful house in Palm Springs. So it's a lot to get me to decide to do eight shows a week in New York. I'm at a place in my life where it was hard to go do Pippin on tour for seven months. I mean, I, I can't believe I said yes to that. We had just moved to Palm Springs and that offer came in. and But it was so unusual, so bizarre, that part. And it was such a challenge I, I had to try. Yeah. I don't know that I would do that again. I would never say never, depending on the circumstances. But so having said that, that sort of is not my go-to anymore. Uh, series for the same reason. Do I want to pick up and go live in Los Angeles and be on a show day after day there and live there? And would Larry come with me? Do I leave? I've gotten really selfish in my old age. You know, I want to do so nightclubs suit me just fine. Yeah. I can go out, whether it's for a week or two weeks or two days, or that's about ever as long as it is three weeks. Then I come back. I have a week home or whatever. Then I go back out again for a that's fabulous. And it's live and it's music and it's acting too, because that's what music is. And um, kind of kind of suits me just fine to be doing that. If something else comes along, I evaluate. And Larry always says, whatever you want to do. Of course, I don't need you to be here all the time, but that's my husband, Larry. I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. You know, it's just, I don't, as I said, film is wonderful on one reason, for one reason, because you film it and it's there right. forever. I mean, even this interview, if it's being taped, if it, you could go to your website and you can probably see it. Again, theater, you see it. Whoever sees it, that's it. That's it, right. Some nights you wish to God someone had taped it. Yes, yeah. But it's that's, that's what's special about it. You never know what's going to happen. And as an audience, that's what's so thrilling because you know it's live. You know they can't stop and fix it. It's always going to go on. It's going to just yeah. keep going. And there's, it's a thrilling. It's absolutely thrilling, and I and I love that. You know, how do you balance the home life, which you love so much, and then raising the kids, and then being out there and doing all that you've done and continue to do, having you know a loving relationship with this fine gentleman here, Larry, all these years, also a fellow fellow extraordinary actor in his own right. How, how do you find a balance that works for for? everybody involved it's got to be difficult in some way shape or form as you obviously saw with your 
fabulous parents that sometimes the pressures of it all and the demands, it starts out simple. It's a beautiful idea it, it's to bring us together and keep us together. And then it becomes larger than us. And then it goes, you know, yeah. from there, how have you been able to, to do it in the way that you've done it? Uh, I have to say, I haven't always really done it very well. I don't think anybody can say they've learned to balance it perfectly without trial and error. I think I thought for a while that I was balancing it better than my parents did, could, because they were working in a brand new medium they were actually inventing. And it meant early morning to very late at night. And I was already born. And then my brother was born and we were home and we didn't see them a lot. And um, yeah, weekends, but then there were interviews and they were on the phone or whatever. So it was, it was, that was hard. And I didn't want my kids to have to deal with that. So working actress, my husband's working actor, we tried to do that differently. And I, you know, made sure that I got up to cook the meals for them. And we drove the kids to school. I'm going to go to the doctors, uh, things that my parents never could have done. I, yes, we're going to go to the school plays. They were unable to ever do that. You know, we've done a much better job. And then we realized, no, we haven't, not really. Kids were acting out left, left and right and having all kinds of problems. And because I wasn't spending enough individual time with them every day and individual time every day could mean just like 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes with each one of your kids where you're not on the phone, you're not cooking dinner, you're, you're not doing something else while you're talking to them like this, one-on-one, um, -on -one, so that they know that they are worthy of love, yours and somebody else's someday. I didn't learn that until my daughter, who's the youngest one, was about four years old, so the others were six and eight. And, and I think it made a huge difference that we, you know, were not able to do that in their, in their lives, They'll tell me now that, you know, oh, well, we were well-traveled and we knew you loved us and yada, yada, yada. But there were problems. And balance is not an easy thing to accomplish. I think maybe now, maybe now I'm a little bit better at it. But I, let's hope so after 42 years of marriage and, you know, five kids we raised together and three grandkids. It's never been an easy job. But it has been the most fulfilling, rewarding job I've ever had in my life. I wouldn't yeah. change them. I would I would change a minute of I go back and spend more time the right way with them if I could, but I can't. <laughs> so I do what I can now to make up for it, you know. Absolutely. And uh, I have a good marriage. My husband yeah. is an amazing guy who has taught me how to be a human and how to solve problems when there's when they come up in a marriage where in my family I didn't see that a lot. I saw a lot of yelling and screaming and door slamming and only after they were divorced was there a lot of like friendliness and music and uh, yeah. happy times. So, and he, he came from a crazy family of, you know, alcoholism and everything else, but somehow he brought to me the ability to get sane and tranquilidad, you know, and get through, walk back in the room and say, Hey, I'm sorry. What, you know, I didn't hope that I wasn't really, wasn't about you when it really wasn't his fault. And I should have been the yeah. one to but he knew that if he did it, it opened the door so that I could talk to him and then we would get through it again. And I hope I can give that to my children in their relationships because nothing is perfect. No relationship is always going to be 100% great. You have these horrifying times where you think, that's it, I'm out of here. And it's not always true. It all depends on you know your communication, really, I think, with the other person and your love. That's the key to it all. Absolutely. And, and working on it and enhancing it and tweaking it as much as possible. And you got to get help. Just really, If you have good help, you have mentors and therapists and people that you trust that can show you a different way to look at things, a different way to, uh, to absorb it. Like, oh, that happened to you, but let's look at it like this. Let's, let's say this is what actually happened just then. And what if it doesn't mean that? What if they didn't mean that? What if that's right. not about you? You know? Hmm. And then you can go back and, retrace your steps and find out what actually got you upset. Oh, maybe it wasn't about that at all. Maybe that was a trigger from a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And then, and then that's fascinating. And I think, you know, psychology and how people grow and change and develop is, is a fascinating thing to learn about. So 
I always, I think we're much luckier today because we have David Friedman and we have Dr. Phil's and, you know, Oprah's and, and shows talking to us about uh, how our mind works and exactly. how we can be more at peace and all of that. We didn't have that growing up in the 50s and my parents certainly didn't have anything like that, nor were you allowed to search for it or they thought, you know, you need to be put away in a padded cell. So there's a lot at people's disposal today to make their lives better and if they just go out and look for it, you know. We talk a lot on this show with the, the guests that come through and the viewers about the importance of empathy and kindness and and sharing it and, and realizing that we're all one and we rely on each other and need each other. And we've been talking about these teachable moments mm -hmm. that we've learned as a result of what we've experienced the last couple of years. And these are some through all the horror, it's still some golden moments and opportunities yes, to express the kindness, express the empathy. And I keep saying, I hope that we rise from the ashes of it all more loving and kinder and, and closer. And uh, I'm a Libra, so I'm balanced and harmony. I'm always looking for ways to, you know, take this extreme, that extreme, bring it together and bring us mm -hmm. to the table and see what we could do. And maybe each of us can get a piece of the loaf of the bread and, you know, sort of equalize things out and just bring us together. Um, easier yeah. said than done, but I, I, I never well, give up, you know? you know, Jim, you have a voice, you have a platform. And so that's fantastic because you are one of the people who can actually help people hear that message and find ways you can have guests on the talk about it you can you can help people find it which is great not a, not all of us can share our gifts i can i can be on your show i can do my show i can you know i can probably write something somewhere maybe somebody will print it or put it online um not everybody has that opportunity to find that help or to give it so you're you know, you're, you're, uh, very lucky. When did you, uh, realize who your parents were in terms of what the world felt about them? I always wondered that, you know, when you have parents that are so beloved by the world yet to you, they're mom and dad, they're your mother and your father, but yet you mm -hmm. see the world you know, he's in love with them, can't get enough of them, wants mm -hmm. them here, there, everywhere. When did you first realize that? Because to you, there'll always be yeah. dad and mom to the world, of course, yeah. icons in the industry. But when did that first click in for you? Not a clue. <laughs> I have no answer to this question. I mean, I have, I have no idea. I, I have no idea. I don't think that moment ever registered. Uh, uh, oh, here's the moment when I... I I don't know. I, I was born the, you know, six weeks before I Love Lucy went on the air. So by the time I was old enough to know that this was my hand, um, <laughs> they were already like the world knew who they were the way they know them now. And to me, that was just the way it is. You know, the sun comes up in the morning, goes down at night. That, that didn't all just suddenly start happening, did it? Um, <laughs> I have no idea what, when, if, if ever, I mean, it's still happening. If it's still, you think, you think it's over kind of, and you know, it dissipated a little, faded a little because they've both been passed on for 30 some years. Right. Yes. Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's like you just said at the beginning, it gets bigger all yeah. the time. So you look more and more as you go along, right? I think what I mentioned before, probably, although I didn't clock it, I didn't clock it and go, oh, huh, it's because of that. Uh, but when I was a kid and they couldn't come to the school plays, right? You couldn't go shopping with them because they, you, people would notice them and it would be you know, horrifying and you take too, too, take too long. The stuff that your parents didn't do with you that your girlfriend, Alice or somebody, th their parents could do it. And then you think, oh, well, their work is different. I mean, you, you, we had friends whose parents were doctors or policemen and their work was different too. They weren't always home or, you know, they were at the dinner table and then whoop, there they go. You know, they, we don't know why. I just figured they had one of those jobs that, um, that, that was the downside, but, but we got perks too. So I didn't really, I didn't really add it up to anything. You know, there were, oh, we're at Disneyland. We get to go on the Matterhorn twice without waiting in line again. That's cool. You know, <laughs> kids are just, gonna go with it whatever it is because they don't know i didn't know any differently i didn't know what the yeah. opposite was supposed to be like so sometimes you know when when family members pass on and we learn more and more about them when we learn these little nuggets um 
our appreciation for what they went through, the struggles, what they mm -hmm. tried to accomplish, what they tried to offer right. us uh, becomes deeper and richer and even more meaningful because, you know, we were kids and we were finding ourselves and doing our thing. But then you look back and you're like, wow, these were amazing people that accomplished such great things, pioneers, you know, on many levels. And they were trying to do something fantastic that touched mm -hmm. the world in many ways. So you sort of look at that in a more deeper way as time goes on. Do you, did that happen for you? Does that continue to happen as you find more about Absolutely. your parents? Yes, and also as parents, I think we do that, whether your parents are famous or not. Anyway, right. you know, we have our feelings about our, what our parents were like as mom and dad and parents, and they were too strict, or they didn't let me do this, or they believed this, and they told me this, and whatever. We have feelings about our parents. And then you grow up and you become a parent. <laughs> And you're faced with the same choices that they were faced with, only yeah. you have to think, oh, but she or he came to that with all of this baggage. Oh, my God. Yes. And there. And I learned a lot of that when I did my documentary, Lucy and Desi a Home Movie, and that was released in 1993. Because I interviewed all these people who grew, either grew up with my folks or worked with them in the early days or, uh, you know, knew them later on in life. And I picked their brain about those times. And if you walk a mile in your parents' shoes, any any of you listening, not, not just because you have parents who are well known, you walk a mile in their shoes and you can't carry the same grudges or chips on your shoulder that you used to because you think, well, I didn't like that that happened or that she made this decision or he made that choice. But geez, if I had gone through that and then that happened to me and then I was put into that place right there and given that choice, would I have made a different choice? Probably not. So it makes a huge difference when you when you go back and you reevaluate what who they were as people, as just people just trying to get through their lives, you know? And even if you realize that there were things that were still in retrospect, not good. These are bad, you know, no bad. I don't believe bad anymore. But challenging uh sort of personality, let's call them challenges, you know, whether it's alcoholism or it's anger management problems or obsessive compulsive, you know, got to stay busy or I'll explode. Whatever it is, it's not about you. Right. And you can sort of look back and go, wow, I wonder how that got started. And, and you feel empathy, like you just said, compassion for what they were going through. Yes. trying to deal with their own traumas and their own childhood memories and all of that stuff. It's just one big giant circle, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I, you know, I, I encourage everyone I know to kind of do a little retrospective walk through your folks past. Very yeah. Cathartic. Yeah. Merlin loves your hair. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah, I call it my COVID cut and color because of course we couldn't go anywhere for the first year or so. And there wasn't any, I wasn't going to go anywhere and go, you know, my roots are getting a little long. I just said, well, that isn't going to happen. Can't go to a salon. So one night I just cut them all down to the nubbies and let my natural color come through. And then I continued to cut my own hair for a year and a half because I couldn't get anybody else to do it. I cut Larry's hair. I cut my hair. And I still do from time to time. Um, I have a guy who cuts my hair now and I can go there and not worry. But when I'm on the road or I go, it's getting a little long, like just the other day, I just trimmed my, and I, it's, it's not that hard and it's kind of fun. <laughs> I love it like this too. So I'm glad that people are uh, enjoying it. They're, it looks yeah, fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It looks positively Thanks. fantastic. Thank you. And uh, Joey says, congratulations on your grandson. Right Two now. grandsons, JD right. and George, one for my daughter, Kate, and one for my son, Joe, and a granddaughter named Eliza Grace. That's Joe's daughter. So yeah, they're just, they're going to be hellions, awesome. all of them, because they're way too smart. They said, get ready for Joe, get ready, because this is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be one hell of a ride. <laughs> It's uh, it's a beautiful experience for sure. You know, um, as, as much as uh, we, we talk a lot about um, how funny your mom is, 
but your dad had this incredible sense of humor. Your mother, more of this brilliantly trained actor, actress who can take the script and make it funny and nail it and be exacting about it. Your dad had this natural wit about him and humor, which every time I've, you know, been you know in the room with you you have it too it just rolls off you you have this fabulous which i love witty dry sense of humor where it's like spit takes it's immediate like you can see something going on in front of you and immediately come up with a quick-witted observation about what the heck is going on that's crazy mm -hmm. right in front of you uh, your dad responsible for so much of the success of course of of the series and all these other shows, the two of them together that Desi Lou created. But your dad had this wonderful sense of humor as well, huh? Yeah, I think it's a Cuban thing. I mean, they went through such hell over there most of the time and then the revolution, but the Latin people in general, Cubans, I think, especially the ones that I've met have this really funny hell's gonna you know fall on our heads in any minute so let's have fun kind of attitude about life and it's a can do kind of an attitude like there must be a way my father always said there must be a way and they would they don't get discouraged easily and they use their humor to get through rough times making up all kinds of jokes about some very dark things but it's how they get through and he was always like that around my house and i've become like that um gratitude has a lot to do with it. I mean, I tried, today was hard, as I said in the beginning. When these things happen, it's really hard to just be grateful and go on. And these are the these are the moments that challenge us the most. But in general, with little nothing bad stuff, nothing challenging, kind of just regular day annoyances, um, if I use my humor, I get through it much, 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 much better. And as I said, our dear friends, you know, Sean Moniger, David Friedman, one of the things I loved about both of them, is that they're so freaking funny. And we may be talking about very metaphysical, spiritual things, but humor always comes into it. I couldn't be around people who can't find humor in life. Yeah, Marvin right. Hamlish, when I did their playing our song, became a very close friend of mine. And one of the things I loved about Marvin, no matter where we were, no matter what the circumstances, he always found the fun. He always found the humor. And I've been around an awful lot of people in my life like that. Yes. And, and I gravitate toward that. It's like a tonic, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's how you can get through because life is always going to be tough. It's always going to have stuff thrown at you every day. Like just the last four days traveling. I love to travel. It was mercury and retrograde. <laughs> I mean, everything was canceled. Everything was delayed. It was the wrong hotel. I'm in the wrong room. It was like you couldn't do something that wasn't going to get screwed up. And after a while, it became hilarious. I mean, it was like, okay, this you can't write this stuff. I mean, yeah. other people could go insane and, you know, drink a bottle of wine in order to get through it. I was like, you know what? Just let the plane land. That's all. As long as we, as long as it takes off and it lands, I'm happy. Exactly. You, you know, you mentioned uh, they're playing our song. That was a very important uh, time in your life too. Um, tell us Indeed. about when that opportunity came your way. I mean, Robert Klein, Neil yeah. Simon, Marvin Hamlish, Carol Bear Sager. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, that wasn't. grouping. Amy, tell us. Danny Eisenberg produced. Yeah. 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 Well, it was my first Broadway show ever. I was doing uh, Annie, get your gun out at Jones beach in Massapequa, Long Island for the entire summer, 1978. And I, I guess maybe there was some buzz because I was close to New York and it was a, a summer theater engagement for the whole summer. And I got a New York Times review. So people in New York were gonna read about it. And it was a good review, very good review. And um, got a new, you know, a Al Hirschfeld caricature. And it was like, suddenly you were a person, um, you were a theater person. And so I was sent that script. I was sent a, a script to this new Neil Simon musical. And uh, I got very excited about it after I read it. And I was like, oh my God, this is so me. I, there's, this is the best thing I've ever been asked to do. And it's, it's me, it's me. I know I can play this part. And I went in and auditioned for it, for Neil and for Manny and uh, Robert Moore, the director. And I, I, I did a good reading, but I, I screwed up the song I sang. I sang a song that I actually wrote the lyrics to and I screwed up my own lyrics. So that was hilarious, not. <laughs> 
<laughs> who was deaf at an audition, but they were very kind and Neil was adorable. And um, I left there feeling pretty good about their reaction. And then I didn't hear anything for almost two months. Mm. Nothing. Nothing and at they, all. They apparently had had a list of a hundred and some girls they were going to see after me. I was the first one they saw. So I lived the rest of the whole summer reading that, you know, all these people were going to be in the show, Bette Midler was, oh no, it's Cher and then you know, blah, blah, blah. Dying, sweat in the middle of the night thinking, no, this can't be, this is not, this, I'm not even going to entertain the thought that I'm not going to, and somehow tell the universe what you want, be specific. I got a phone call and they said, um, you got the job. Wow. And I went through the roof. I actually jumped so hard on my platform bed that I had just bought in New York that I cracked my coccyx bone. I got so excited when they told me I got that job. I actually, <laughs> I came down and went, ow! Yeah. <laughs> so that was just one of those That's... magnificent beginnings after that. Where do you go from there? It was hard to find another there playing our song, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah. Especially in the 80s. It was like yeah. Starlight Express and Cats. You had to have whiskers right. or sweets, you know, to right. <laughs> <laughs> and true. then it's it is true. And then all these years later, it's brought back yes, for an iconic time. Ah, tell us about that when they approached you about doing that, huh? Well, there was a one. There's a wonderful guy, a wonderful producer named Robert Greenblatt, who uh, was the head of NBC for years, and then he went to Time Warner, and it was show. To, he created uh, some of the best shows on television, and he's a a new friend of mine, he lives has a house here in Palm Springs, and he came over for lunch one day, I'll make this short, and said, uh, hey, you know, I'm a big fan of their playing our song, too, and yes, gonna be, isn't it going to be the 40th anniversary like next year? And I said, yes, can you believe it, 40 years, what are you going to do? I said, oh, nobody's mentioned anything, we're not doing anything. And he said, oh, well, you got to do something. Yeah. Somebody's got to do something. And I said, well, I haven't, I haven't heard, I am actually booked to do a show in Florida on that exact night. And he said, let let me get into this. And next thing I knew, he had booked the Music Box Theater. He had mm -hmm. a 22-piece orchestra, our original conductor. I contacted Robert Klein. And then he said yes, and we had some of the original voices. And we did one night at the Music Box Theater and raised over $150,000, something like that, for Actors Fund. It was an Actors Fund performance. And it was magical. We went back and did those parts, you know, 40 years later, I'm playing Sonia Walsk and he's doing Vernon Gersh. And, and it was a basically a concert version, but we had little pieces of costumes and I have, it's a very prop and costume every show. So we had to put something in there about that. And, uh, and it came off great and the audience was over the moon. So we're yeah. very fortunate. And I, I thank Robert Greenblatt for saying, well, sure, we're gonna do something. Well, well of course we will. And he made it happen. That Pippin opportunity, too, I was mentioning uh, mm -hmm. in the introduction, I had a chance to see you do your thing, yeah. that uh, that run of Pippin. That was absolutely extraordinary. And this was uh, this was backstage then mm -hmm. uh, after. Yeah, and and yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, you got a chance to meet my mother, too. And she yeah. still talks about that evening and, and loved it. What uh, when you had that opportunity to partake in. Pippin, uh, what did you first think when they presented that to you? You you were unbelievable in it. Well, the acrobatics was, was yeah. We we were still <laughs> we were um, still living in were we still living in no. I guess I was moving. I was in the process of moving to Palm Springs, but from I was Connecticut, back right? Hmm? From Connecticut. Yes, from Connecticut, yeah. and and yeah. but I was. Uh, doing some gigs, some concerts back east. I was in Atlantic City in New Jersey somewhere. And I got a call. Remember, I was in the car, got a call from Barry Weisler, the producer of the Broadway show, you know, the new acrobatized smash hit version of Pippin that was on Broadway. And he was telling me, and I'd worked with him before in my one and only on tour with my one and only. And he said, Lucy, we're getting ready to cast the first national tour of Pippin. Would you consider coming in and playing Grandma Bertha on the tour. Well, I was a Tony voter just before moving to Palm Springs for 15 years because I was on the, the American Theater Wing board. So I was one of the first people to actually get there and see that show when it opened. And I was stunned, astounded, gobsmacked. Oh my God, I'd never in my life seen. And I love the show, the music anyway. And I remember, you know, Andrea Martin playing that part and it just stopped my heart and it stops the show. She gets more applause than anybody at the end of the show. So the ego in me and the actor in me was like, hmm, 
don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And he said, I know it's a little intimidating, but come on, if you can come down. I said, well, I happen to be in New York uh, tomorrow. Should I come to the set and like look? And they said, yes. And they'd love to put you up on the trapeze and see if you have afraid of, if you're afraid of heights. And anyway, I ran through the motions with them just to see how it felt and whether they thought they could train me. And they said, you're very flexible. And I said, I'm in terrible shape. I haven't done anything for the longest time. And they said, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. We're gonna, you'll do exercises and we'll do training and you'll be fine. We had three weeks, that's all we had, three weeks to learn how to do that. And along with everybody else, learning the music and everything else, the dance and whatnot. So Larry said, how can you turn that down? That's like the best part ever. And I was in Palm Springs, maybe a couple of months. And then off I went on a tour and left him here. And it was one of the most exciting, thrilling, incredible things I've ever done in my life. And I'm so proud that I learned how to do what I did. Hang upside down like that. No wires, no nets. Just an acrobat holding me around my pelvis. <laughs> in a bold position. I mean, it was insane. A high wire dance trapeze act while you're singing your song. You know, I would go back in a minute and do it again just to get that body back. Just to get that. <laughs> <laughs> they, I was in the best shape I'd ever been in my life when I did that show. <laughs> oh. you, you know, but uh, chip off the old block a little bit because, of course, your mother always was so physical in her comedy as well. Do you think some of that uh, is in, running through your veins as well? <laughs> well, I, I'm very brave. You know, I yeah. try things. And um, we always did when I was yeah. growing up on the show. They would write crazy physical stuff for us to do. And we did it. And I learned uh, to be very careful and you have to work with the right people and don't be stupid, but they were incredible. You know, Pippin, the, these people who created the, the, Oh gosh, I'm going to say the name of the dance of the uh, acrobat troupe wrong, but it was an amazing group of people who were extraordinarily careful and extraordinarily professional. And we worked out every single day. I tried that, uh, dance trapeze thing before the show before every show i yeah. got up and did it once at you know at warm-up time and as a matter of fact the first time they started calling me in uh, while we were in you know rehearsal we're actually doing the shows now and, and there was a warm-up that started a half hour before half hour and uh they would get on the mic i'll be upstairs you know putting starting to put my makeup on pinning my hair for the wig and i would hear acrobats to the stage please acrobats to the stage <laughs> and i would go mm. I would keep doing this and then go, Miss Arnaz to the stage, please. I was like, I'm an acrobat. <laughs> oh, like, I couldn't believe that I was being called that. Yeah. But I was one of the acrobats. Yeah. Um, I can be crazy that way. I work with animals the same way snakes and lions and bears. And it's just fun. You know, yeah. it was great fun. If you're careful, I was careful. And I put one yeah, foot me. in front of the other and followed yeah. what they told me to do. And somehow it worked. Yes. You mentioned um, my one and only Tommy Toon. Tell us about Tommy. Tommy oh, you yeah. got all these wonderful things. Yes. Well, that was seven months of the, some of the best seven months of my life. Again, as I say in my, my show, I got the job songs from my musical past to be in your neck of the woods soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I say that. You need to go into voiceovers. I love it. I <laughs> But li literally, just learning the amount of tap dancing required oh, yeah. to keep up with him, to keep up with that guy, was like getting a, a college degree in dance. Yeah. And I always had a little bit of tap dancing background from being in, doing little bits of dance and stuff in the show, and here's Lucy, and, and some regional theater stuff that I did. But that was a lot. That was an awful lot of really first-rate tap dancing and I was so proud of myself for learning it and doing that. I mean, it's almost as hard, actually harder than the trapeze, much harder on, on the time involved in your body. And <laughs> my knees are still suffering, but I've never been happier in my life. <laughs> I tell you, you, uh, you really are a go-getter and you always have been, which is, I think, one of the things that everybody uh, loves about you, Lucy. You just really, you know, and when you're on stage, you are, you're in a zone, aren't you? What happens when you're on stage and you're working with the audience and you're working with the likes of Ron and, and others, Billy Stritch, another great friend. Uh, 
you're electrifying and you're so relatable and you're so warm. I'm, and I'm saying this to folks who maybe they're watching like, gee, I didn't even know she does these shows. You know, I I'm didn't realize she does this, um, that you're very relatable and warm and funny. And it's a, it's a full, you don't want it to end. You, you just uh -huh. absolutely don't want it to end. It's so sweet. Thank you. Yeah. And, and what's cool about it is you have this, you're very affable and approachable, uh, even though, you know, you're uh, an iconic figure in, in acting and, and television and film and all the rest. Uh, still, you're, you're Lucy, you're, you're approachable, you're warm, you're real, you're very authentic, which I think some, a lot of people find refreshing when they meet you or when they see you in your shows or elsewhere. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I would only hope that that is true and that that's what people think because that's what I'm trying to be. I, I don't have a facade when I get out there. It doesn't work for me to do that. Um, the only way I could learn to be on stage and not be in a, in a character per se, because doing concerts is way different than being in a character like Sonia Walls or being in my one and only and playing a character. You're on stage as Lucy Arnaz. And when you look down, you're talking to the audience. There's no fourth wall. Um, you become characters in a sense when you sing a lyric, you're telling a story and you put yourself in a position of a certain circumstance. So in that respect, I'm still an actress going into those moments, but then you come out of those moments and then you're just going, did I ever tell you about, you know, and you're speaking to the people in front of you. So it must suit me. I think it does come a lot from watching my father do it so well. He did it great. He was really wonderful with an audience and going from singing, talking lyrics that he, you know, he was brilliant that way. And we had a lot of people around us when I was growing up who were, who were magnificent at yeah. standing up and being in front of an audience and a band and talking and singing and then telling stories and you just soak it up, you know? And, and I didn't want to be anybody else in the beginning. You start singing, you try to be like other singers you think you've seen or try to make your voice sound like this. And then you go, well, this isn't working for me. I can only be me. I can't try to sound like anybody else. I can't try to tell jokes like somebody else. But it takes a while to find that person, even though the person is you. But it's like you're looking all around for who this person should be. And you go, oh, look at here. Oh, this person is me. I think that's me. <laughs> and this show, I got the job, Songs from My Musical Past. That show is <laughs> the most authentic show that I've ever done because it's actually all about stuff that I've actually done. You know, I'm, I'm, telling about shows that I've been in and stories about those shows and people I worked with in those shows. And although I may go there in my head when I get into one of the numbers from one of those shows, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm not in my head as that character. I'm in my head as a person who could be singing that exact same song today in a, with another thought in mind. Um, but it's always true. And it's always me. So I don't have to make up anything. All the other shows I've done, although I don't lie, but they're songs, they're just songs that kind of, I like to sing, but they don't really necessarily always have something to do with my life. So you create a pattern, a dialogue around them in order to introduce where you're going in the song. And there's a certain amount of, you know, makeup stuff there just so that the song will work and blah, blah, blah. But in this show, it's not true at all. It's just one moment after another of saying, did I tell you about, did you, do you know what happened when I, and you're yeah. just telling the truth. And so, it feels like the most authentic I've, I've been on stage with people in a long time. Mm, absolutely. A couple of comments coming in here, some really beautiful things that people have been saying throughout. You know, uh, I'm very interactive with the audience. Uh, Veronica Lee is watching in Australia. says, your memories of your own experiences would make for a fascinating star-studded read, even without going into your experiences in your youth with your parents. Is there a book writing in your future? Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. And I'm so happy to hear you say that because one of the things that has stopped me from wanting to correlate some of my memories and whatnot is the idea that people only want me to write about them, my, my folks, and that they don't really want to hear about me or my work or me. You know, it's like, oh, tell me about living with your parents. I mean, because even like with the people I adore and even today with you, most people are interested an awful lot about, well, what was it like and how'd you deal with that and what were they like here? And but here's what I figured out. I went, I'm listening to um, 
Ron Howard's book right now called The Boys with his brother Clint, right? Now he's oh. Ron Howard. He has an entire career as an actor, as a director, da, 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 da. And I'm like in chapter 16 already. And he's still talking about growing up at home yeah. with his parents. And right. his parents weren't famous. It's because it's what molded him. It's what yeah. his life was like. What he was like as a young kid and then as a teenager and what they allowed him to do and what they didn't allow him to do. And as a film director, he knows that this is fascinating stuff. And we're very curious because he's Ron Howard. We'd like to know, did you live like I did, Ron? You know, And, and um, so I think I'll just write my damn story and it will have what it needs to have about growing up in my household. And these two people were my parents, my parents. And were they famous? I, I, yeah, but you know, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that. I made documentaries about that. You can go watch yeah, the documentaries and see right. the movies we did. You know, we go watch those other things. This would be, plus I've already done my documentary, so I don't need to do that. If you want to know about my parents and not me, go watch that. But I want to write about all these other amazing experiences, many of which we just talked about. And there yes. are hundreds more yes. that I was fortunate enough to experience. I, As I say in my show, I got the job songs from my musical past. <laughs> that I have been so fortunate during this long theatrical career yeah to have worked with some amazing people i mean you could have a really long career and go back and look through the cast lists of the shows you've been in and they might not well i don't know those are just regular nice actors but nobody you know not mentors like or famous people that could really you know teach you things not so in my life i have been so incredibly fortunate to have gotten jobs in shows, first of all, that were written by some of the greatest composers on the planet, which is an amazing thing to get to, uh, to absorb that music, you know, and to have worked with directors like Michael Bennett and Mike Nichols. And just how did that happen? I don't know. You know, to to share the stage with the, the Neil Diamonds and the Laurence Olivier's and the Tommy Toons and Robert Klein's and just amazing folks and work with the Marvin Hamlishes of the world and the Stephen Schwartzes of the world and and then filter in what it's like to be a mom and try to balance work and marriage and um, that's enough right there how could I do that and have enough room to tell you all you want to know about Lucio Baldessi Arnaz I can't right but I will talk enough about it so that you'll know what my life was like growing up in that household with those two people who were my parents you know what's wonderful about you, Lucy, too, is even with having them as your parents, you carved out your own niche. You are Lucy. You have your own talents. You have your own path. You have followed your own path. You've beautifully preserved and, and honored and, and reveled in um, and understood and appreciated what people think about Lucio Bol and Desi Arnaz, your mom and dad, but you also have carved out your own spectacular career and you have your own stamp and you have your own mark and you have your own message and your own voice while still honoring what they accomplished, you still were able to do that. And that's not always the case all the time. Sometimes it's just do exactly what they were doing or, you know, mm -hmm. They That'd were, be no fun. <laughs> right. And, and they were so almost larger than life that you almost totally. feel like you can never, match up or compete I still or anything like that. I still feel like I never expect to match up or, or compete. I wouldn't want to in a million years. That, right. That was a, a, you know, a constellation that will never be seen again. That was their right. That's never going to happen again. Yeah. Boom. And it was there. And I was lucky to get some of the sparkle dust, you know, uh, but my life is my life. And so Absolutely. I just, I, and I don't know if I instinctively, I was so young at the time, so I, I can't imagine that I had a, you know, an agenda, but I instinctively gravitated toward the stage, which is interesting because my mother was television and some movies and my father was mostly music and band leading and touring with music. And then he became television and producing, right? Acting, yes, but more the producer and the band leader and that. And my brother was an actor on in movies, television, and then he was a musician and had a band like Dino Desi and Billy. So everybody had like that and nobody was in the theater. 
And somehow I decided I wanted to be theater. So maybe part of me was, a, it was like, get your own lifeboat because you know, you can't compete over there. You got to go on another road entirely. And I'm very, very happy that I did. Cause you can always do that other stuff too. Right. I mean, and I, and that's what I, I, later I could do that, but it was my safe place. It was my, my Harbor was musicals and singing in front of people. You know, that's what I wanted to do. Harry Parrish uh, says, yes, we all love Lucy, but your help in furthering your understanding of the contributions and extreme talent of your dad is something that you've done beautifully as well. Thank uh, you. Which is really, really nice. Yeah, I appreciate she's the star of the show and it's called I Love Lucy. And she got to do all the really funny, funny stuff that we remember. All the, the bits were written for her more than for my father. And um, he can get lost in the shuffle sometimes. And, you know, he... He had problems with his health and alcoholism for a while. Um, so he, he, he kind of dug his own hole there a little bit. But in retrospect, I think what he did and what he accomplished with where he came from and what happened to him is kind of a miracle. And I always, when people want to honor her, or let's say it's you know some organization or some college or they want to do a thing for Lucy, for Lucy. And I go, well, how about Lucy and Desi? How about you do both of them? I mean, is there a reason why you wouldn't include my father? And I don't do it for any other reason than it's just fair. It just seems right. It seems wrong not to, you know? Exactly. It wouldn't have been them. They wouldn't have had I Love Lucy if it was just one of them. That's right. Exactly right. Exactly. You know, you, um, you had that and I don't know if you're thinking about bringing it back, but it was fantastic. You're, uh, when you went on tour and you did Latin Roots, mm -hmm. is there any, and again, if anybody gets a chance to see it, if you do bring it back, run and get your ticket. But is that oh, something yeah. that you would love to uh, resurrect and bring oh, back? Oh, I do it. I do it still. It's just, um, I guess, well, especially in the last couple of years, the pandemic, oh, sorry, don't say that too loud. Uh, this shutdown, uh, has made it hard for people to spend money. And so even yeah, when they yeah. are coming back, the concerts are are less like they're saying, oh, we have to spread the people out. We can't make as much money. We don't have as much money to, to pay for people, blah, blah, blah. So they're, you, you find yourself working, you know, in a much smaller arena sometimes. That show is more expensive. It's a big band. You can't do yeah. that show without a big band. Right. And I love doing that show. And I will do it again. I've had, I have... Men, there were many offers before the shutdown that I couldn't do. And so now we're just still trying to rebook it. And when is it convenient for that theater again? And it's a process, you know, but the Latin Roots show is, it's funny because it's really not my, the Babalu show we did in New York at the 92nd Street Y was my father's story. Right. All of his arrangements of the Desi Arnaz Orchestra. And it was Raul Esparza and me and my brother Desi and Papa Pepin and Valerie Pettiford. It was a big group and 17 piece orchestra. This is Latin Roots based on the album that I put out same time we did the Babalu show. And it's basically my story of how I got into the music business because it was through my dad. Right. And then after he passed away, finding tapes about his show. And so I, I bookend it with his music, but it's really me doing my music, but with a Latin yeah. feel. And um, so it's everything. I mean, I love doing it because it's me and it's him and it's my tip of the straw hat, if you will, to my dad. And for giving me what I do now, I basically, you know, yeah. credit him with the fact that I sing and dance for a living. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned in unearthing his tapes. You also did that with your mother with Let's mm -hmm. Talk to Lucy, mm -hmm. which was something pretty cool. She recorded these back in the uh, the 60s, huh? You made them mm -hmm. available. Uh, 65 and 60, 64 and 65. And I know I always knew that we, we had these uh, stored somewhere, but I didn't pay much attention to them. And then um, when we were getting ready to do the documentary with Amy Poehler, we we're looking through archives of what haven't they seen and what didn't you use last time? And I said, well, there are these Let's Talk to Lucy shows. And, and I, I found some of those and they couldn't use big, that wasn't really appropriate for the documentary. But I thought, you know, how many of those shows are there? And who's on them? Like, who'd she talk to? Because yeah. I knew one or two people like Sinatra and Barbara Streisand. But who were there? Oh my God, there's 240 interviews and they were with everybody you can imagine. And it was like a time capsule of Life and, you know, show business in 1964 and five, it was, it's insane. 
So we uh, brought them to Sirius XM. They gave her immediately gave a pop up channel called Let's Talk to Lucy, and it was on twenty four seven for three weeks. And now they are available as downloads, podcasts on Sirius XM, or I, I, whatever. Yeah, wherever the, wherever you get your podcasts, any place there are podcasts. You just put Let, Let's Talk to Lucy, and you can download all these wonderful. Then I started calling people who uh, were today's important people, celebrities and otherwise, and editing some of my mother's questions from 64 and five from the original show and letting my mother ask these people the same questions. And so we have interviews of these contemporary people that are also part of the po podcast now. Really fun stuff to do. And then I found other tapes uh, that I did not have when I was doing my own documentary, which was my mother's voice uh, speaking into a tape recorder again as she was answering questions about what became her autobiography called Love Lucy. And we didn't find until after she passed away and I edited it, I put it out, but I forgot that there were these tapes that she used and I didn't have them in my possession when we were making the documentary. So Amy Poehler had the benefit of all of these tapes of her actual voice speaking about her life. And that is something, that's a gold mine. Mm. So now was out how we're going to use those so that we can put them out there for people to have in various forms too you know there was this epic production too available on amazon prime video uh that amy was was heading up tell us about that and how this came about this was really extraordinary well they they contacted me uh the white horse pictures people nigel uh sinclair and Jeannie alfant festa they had taken the idea to Ron Howard at Imagine Entertainment and said, we'd like to do a documentary on Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz, and uh, what do you think? And he, he's a fan, and uh, they were. So they contacted me, and we had a, a very productive lunch one day where basically I said, why do you want to do another documentary? I already did one. Like, yeah. And it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, we think it's time, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, you know, they're doing a feature film and I don't think I can even get involved in this because it says in my contract, I, can, I can't get involved in any other biographical things until the feature comes out. But Amazon Pictures, that was the studio for the features, gave us a waiver and said, you know, I don't think it's really gonna matter because the scope of the Sorkin film is much more, it's much narrower and he's not really telling the biography, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, sure, it'll be a companion piece. And then when they really saw what was happening with it, they ended up buying it. So Amazon bought both of them. They own, you know, the original Sorkin piece and now they own this one as well, being the Ricardos, yeah. Hmm. And so I, I, we agreed to do it because of the people who were involved, basically. And I've, I worked with some amazingly professional, they were first rate from the beginning to the end, the way they handled all the assets that I made available to them, which was pretty much everything in my house and everything. Yeah. And they, they took care of it and got it all back to me. They digitized almost everything that wasn't already digitized. Wow. Um, it was a, I, I never say this, flawless experience. It was that one dark moment in the entire thing. And I became quite good friends with Amy Poehler and I adore her and the producers uh, who, you know, for White Horse, they, I think they made a beautiful film. And I think it may get nominated for an Emmy. I wouldn't be a bit surprised because it's really that good, you know? Mm, yeah. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't produce it. I only helped, you know, by allowing them to do it. And, exactly uh, right. And my brother, of course. I When I speak for myself, I speak for Desi as well. You know? Yeah. Now, folks are going to check out the show. And again, it's really, I encourage folks to get your tickets because uh, the shows that have happened thus far have been selling out, right, Lucy? Quickly. Absolutely. Every one yeah. of them, even after going back after COVID, we weren't sure would anybody show up, you know, and it's been sold out wherever we've gone. So I'm so thrilled. As a matter of fact, this weekend, we're going back to the Purple Room in Palm Springs because the Great show time. had a hundred reservations that, that they couldn't fill the three days we did it in March. So we got two more days to make up there that are sold out. And I'm looking forward to going back east in July. Uh, if you go on lucyarnez.com, my yeah. calendar gives you all the upcoming dates, but all of it coming up is Old Forge, New York. I'll be up there doing this show that you see on front of you. And then I'll be at 54 Below uh, my birthday week, July 14th through July 17th. And I'm um, looking because it's uh, you said it's my debut. The debut, my solo show was actually in 2019. And That's they right. asked me to come back much like 
the Purple Room to do four more shows. Bring the same show. Bring the same show. Just come back. Was so excited. Nobody's ever said that before. Like bring the same <laughs> show, you know. And then the COVID hit, so it all got canceled. And then they rescheduled it. And then they rescheduled it. And then they rescheduled it. And so now we're finally doing the comeback show, the back by popular demand, two years ago, <laughs> in in July. And I'm excited about that. Isn't that cool? I think there was somebody that uh, had posted that they saw a show in, in Pennsylvania recently. And then yes, they I was in Pennsylvania and the, at uh, the Westminster College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, just uh, last Saturday night. And it was great. That's incredible. That's fantastic. And it, it feels yeah. good, you know, after all of us being sort of in our houses to be out there amongst people and, and connecting yeah. with them again. Right. Cause I know you, you absolutely yeah. live for that and love doing I that. I do. And it's been a little difficult because I don't do the meet and greets the same way I used to. It, I love to get out there and be among all the people and everything. But now with the mask things being, you know, eliminated in some places, I'm all vaccinated and I'm all boosted and all of that. But if I should, you know, test positive, which you can still do, even though you're vaccinated, right? It just means you probably won't die. Um, but if I test positive, I got to cancel all my shows again. And I don't want to do that. So I'm very careful. I, you know, I wear my mask and if they want to take pictures, I wear my mask and I come down and go, look, here's my eyes. Still looks like me, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Soon that will be different. Soon it will be gone and we won't um, have to do that anymore. I keep saying that by the time this does end, we're all going to be brilliant ventriloquists because we can talk without anybody seeing the mouths move. We're also <laughs> going to have these permanent lines in our faces right here where are those masks are going to just like. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the same lipstick for two and a half years. Do you know what I mean? I haven't run out of lipstick at all because you never have to wear lipstick because no one ever sees your mouth. And if you put lipstick on, you ruin your mask. <laughs> are you guys, are you tied into a line or something? Is there a um, cosmetic, cosmetic line, line or something? Is, is there something no. anywhere at all that no. uh, you're involved in? No, but that's a wonderful idea, Jim. Perhaps say. someone listening would like to tie me into a cosmetic line. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening, folks. She's available. Very happy to, you know, promote your lipstick for you or your eyeshadow. You are beautiful, Lucy, from uh, Joey. Oh, and, Joey, uh, thank you. Jane watching in Sweden as well. And, Sweden, oh my gosh. This is Carla crazy. watching in Brazil, South Africa. What? Breathtaking episode, Jim. Lucy is so full of life, funny and great. The art of conversation. Wow, thank you tonight. Fantastic. Live from beautiful Brazil. Uh, Cullen Field says, uh, we love Lucy. Um, yeah, yeah. Happy upcoming birthday, Lucy, from Crystal. Thank you, is, Crystal. Yeah, really, really nice. All this. Uh, they're loving the hair, Joseph. Uh, and I believe he's a hairstylist, too, oh, in, in Connecticut, Joseph, in Fairfield County. You. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joseph. How did I did, did, did okay with the haircut. I'm glad to hear that. I just added Let's Talk Lucy to my Spotify. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. It's it's fabulous. You'll you'll have such a good time listening to that. <laughs> I did. I mean, I listened to all of them and I was like, wow. Who knew? And it's not about it's not all about show business. If they talk, mom talks to people about, you know, what kind of dishware they have and how they treat their yeah. pets. I mean, it's really right, exactly it's not just, what it's you expect commonplace stuff because a lot of times mm -hmm. you know they don't want to talk about their show or their they want she to barely just ever promoted somebody's movie or book she would just be like so you know i saw you the other day do you go to the market like that all the time where do you usually shop you know so it's really like a, a you know a, a time capsule like i said of of the way things were back then and uh the politics and oh, i mean there's even some things where you go "Ooh, that's so not politically correct right now but people talk the way they talk, you know. Right, exactly. A couple more comments coming in here. Again, they, they love the hair. The hair is a winner tonight, of course. <laughs> and <laughs> Charlene, uh, thank you for joining Jim and sharing your story and the stories of your parents and family. Interesting and great conversation. George had asked, have you seen the old password episodes of you and okay. Desi, your mom and Gary playing as guests? <laughs> I can't watch. It just it makes me scream. 
I'm at that guppy age, you know, where nothing is working right. And I had a stupid hairdo with a little bow and buck teeth. And <laughs> it's just the, ugh, it's so hard for me to watch. I understand why everybody else thinks they're cute, but I can't. <laughs> Still have Dino, Desi, and Billy albums. Yay! <laughs> Veronica yeah. Lee in Australia says, Lucy, you shine so bright, you could never be lost in anyone's shadow. Oh, thank you. That's yeah. a very nice thing to say. Somebody had asked earlier, too, um, if you felt that Vivian Vance and William Frawley were like extended family for you in certain ways. Oh, Vivian, for sure. Vivian was extended family, extended family for us. She was uh, around a lot. She vacationed with us a lot with her husband or without. And she's my mentor. She's the one that made me start doing theater when I was on the show and reminded me that, you know, getting on stage was one of my first loves and that I should spend some time when we are not filming that, you know, I should go and audition for summer stock and regional. And that's when I started doing that. If it wasn't for her, I don't know that I would have automatically gotten off of television and really made theater a home for myself. That was Viv. Uh, Bill Frawley, I didn't really know because the I Love Lucy show ended when I was seven, right? And I didn't even know Vivian that well, except when she would vacation with us. That's why I knew her. And by the time I got on Here's Lucy, Bill Frawley was actually next door in My, uh, my Three Sons. He was playing Uncle Bub in My Three Sons. So once That's in a while, I'd go in there and kind of say something. But I didn't really know him because he... He was a loner, you know, just like they say in the books, he did his show and then he went to watch the fights or the races and he wasn't like involved in all this show business stuff much. Yeah. You know, uh, Maureen, who is watching, I believe it's in Arizona. She had posted this and it was really a kind thing to write. She's a retired nurse. So she was uh, many years in Arizona. She was on the front lines, you know, helping through everything. She goes, hi, Lucy. I had the honor to meet you uh, in PS after mm -hmm. Eric Bergen's performance back in January of 2020. You signed his set list for me. And let me have a photo op, a night to remember. And yeah. thank you. That's, That's so cool. nice. Listen, I when I saw that show and I loved it, I love him. I had yet to even watch Madam Secretary. And during all of this shutdown, my husband and I started binge watching Madam Secretary. Yeah. And oh my series. he is so good yeah. on that show. He's just an incredible talent. Yeah. Anyway, but I adored his show. And I'm sorry, I think it's done. I don't think they're, is it done, done? I don't know. I don't yeah. want to do that. That's the one thing about falling in love with these wonderful shows during this shutdown is that when it when they're over, you need like a 12-step program, you know, to go, I want my show. <laughs> you get addicted, you know. The, the idea that you can just keep watching and not have to wait till next week to see the next episode is an addictive thing. Is there anything you haven't done like you're talking about the book, which is exciting, but anything you haven't done of, you know, like you say, you, you know, you're a risk taker, you're a go-getter, you always, you know, take on whatever the project is and you give it 110%. Anything out there that uh, is lingering that you still want to do, would love to do if that opportunity came your way? Yeah, I guess it's write the book. I guess that's it. That's the only mm -hmm. genre I haven't really spent any time in. I've produced and directed and uh, sung and danced and done acrobatic things and in movies and films and television and uh, concerts. So I've covered all those bases. It's time to, I'm a good writer. I like writing and it's always been something I have done. I've kept a journal all my life and I used to write lyrics and I've written stories for magazines and newspapers, but I've never really attacked my own story. And I think it's, it's a intimidating thing to think about and I like a good challenge. And so I think being a little frightened of it is a good thing. And I've watched my husband go through this for the last five or seven years. I hope it doesn't take me that long, but- uh, <laughs> Do you I journal? Do you do daily journaling? I, I don't so much anymore, but for years I did, for decades and decades I did. And um, I, I stopped doing it, I think, as my children got a little older and it was just almost impossible to get to my journal. But at the end of the night, I just fall head first into my bed, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, but I'm glad I kept them as many years as I did. Cause I can go back like Larry will ask me something and I go, hang on, and yeah. I go to my box and I find that journal and I go, and I can tell you exactly what happened that day. And you know, Mary Lou Henner can do that without a journal, but I'm right. <laughs> 
We found this photo. It's from Laura Johansson. And I think she's even watching tonight. Yeah. Which I absolutely love. And, and I think you had posted recently. And I would love for the viewers to see this. It's so representative of the, the joy that you give, but also the joy that you have in doing what you do. And it's yes. that one. Oh, Laura's love best picture that. ever. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. We took that yeah. as we were leaving Vitello's, Feinstein's at Vitello's in uh, Los Angeles for my gigs there, which were lovely, three nights full of wonderful people. Yeah, and it was just me picking up all my junk and people give me beautiful flowers. And I was just stopped for one second outside the door and she said, hold it. And I just froze yeah. and she took this wonderful picture. It says so much. And if you if you can see it up close there, even though it's the back of my head, I've my, my, my face is just turned a little bit to the left. Yeah. And I'm actually, I have this amazing contentment smile on my face. That's it, what it I all get. Went so yeah. well, and it's what I love doing. And we were back doing it and it just was a very fulfilling evening. Yeah. It's a great shot. It's a, what they say, a picture said, thank you, Laura. Yes. Laura's Absolutely. responsible for my website and all you know, the social media posts that I put up because I'm sort of bad about being able to know how to do it right. And she understands how to do it. And so I'll post and then she'll like post, post, <laughs> <laughs> post, 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 post. <laughs> I, was, I have just a piece of cracker and she'll turn it into a <laughs> you know. We want to show. <laughs> she's wonderful. And, and she's been in our life for a very long time. And, and she takes the most beautiful pictures. She really does. That is, mm -hmm. that is stunning. We want to show, uh, there is a, a direct website too, to 54 below for those in the New York area who would like to see uh, Lucy Arnaz doing her extraordinary work it is again something amazing love that shot too um, thank you michael childers the yeah. famed hollywood photographer who lives in palm springs and is a dear friend and uh, we decided uh, to do some shots a few years ago and i said now do i have to take brand new ones because my hair is a different color <laughs> photoshop in my hair and so i don't know what we'll that, but they're great shots, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. There it is again, folks. Lucy Hernandez with Ron Abel. And Ron, uh, we've only just started working together 33 years ago. Is that not amazing to, to, I mean, to have a friendship that long and to work together that long, it doesn't get any it's better astounding. than that, huh? It's astounding. I've worked with some other really good musical directors, Billy Stritch, among yes. them, Michael Orland, uh, Ted Firth, you know, and, but it's been primarily Ron for 33 years and there's just nobody like him as you know he's great to be with and to hang with and to travel with and he's so freaking funny and he's just this amazing arranger we do he likes the classics and he likes the great american songbook like i do but he doesn't like to do them like everybody else does them so he's always got a good take here let's do this song like this let hey, listen to this and i love that because it contemporizes, you know, what people think. Oh, I've heard that song. It's like when people say to me, "Can you give me a song list, a rundown of your show?" People in the clubs, or the, they want to see what I'm singing. I go, you know, this is not a good idea, because you may see a song title on there. It's not going to tell you anything, because you don't know what I'm doing with it. You have no idea if that's a ballad or an up tempo or what that is, and, and um, that's because we like to keep you guessing. Joan says, thank you, Lucy. You're beautiful, talented. I hope whatever your wish is, it comes true. Uh, well, I got a lot of them. So thank you for that. Yeah. Early uh, birthday from Mona watching in New Orleans. Happy birthday yeah. early. You look great. What is your secret? Great show tonight. Thanks for sharing your story, Jim. Thanks for having her on tonight. Very entertaining and fun. The pleasure mm -hmm. is uh, all mine. You are, uh, you're amazing, my friend, and, and somebody that Pops in towards the uh, the latter part of our shows. Mr. George Burns is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with George. We've worked together. I've opened for him many times. He's the best. Yeah. What was he like? You know, from somebody George. that actually worked with him. He was, huh? I, well, I worked with him like you know in the last five years of his life, and he was so sweet. And he would warm yeah. up every night before the show in his dressing room with the upright piano, singing old songs. the The piano player would say you know, uh, some I, song I wouldn't even know, like something yeah. from the 20s. And it's not, and he would just like, it was to get his brain working and he'd go, you know, my eyes are seeing the glory. And he would, and he would sing the kind of and they would work like that for about 15, 20 minutes. 
until yeah. they said, George, you're on. <laughs> That's he got up for the show and I just, I adored him. He was a doll. This was my aunt's. He, uh, she, she collected dolls. Uh, and when he turned 100, collected this one and it got passed down to me. And so uh, we just throw it on towards the end. He said, you knocked it out of the park, Lucy. You were George, amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns. <laughs> I know that my granddaughter's name is Eliza Grace and I, I call her Gracie for short. And then we have a new one, a new son. And when he was born, I sort of lobbied for the name George because my husband's middle name is George. And um, it's a good name. It's a good, strong name. And the kids decided they liked it. And so they named him George. So now I have George and Gracie. That is so cool. <laughs> I love it. Um, Veronica Lee in uh, Australia, thank you, Jim Essis, for bringing such a brilliant guest to us all. You're my pleasure. Thank you, Lucy, for sharing your experiences so openly. I look forward to your book. They're already pre-ordering. <laughs> That's oh God, I better hurry up. Gang, LucyArnaz.com is the place to go to learn more about her extraordinary uh, concert coming up. And uh, you are amazing, truly, truly amazing. And I'm so honored and blessed to have you here. Just a nice chat. We'll, you know, we'll keep the porch light on for you, which I say to all the guests. You can always pop on for a quick chat here and there when there are things going on. Uh, we tell the guests, you know, they, they can come on the show for as long as they want. And we just ramble. We don't script anything. There's no, you know, I like to do a warm conversational style. I, I mentioned I try to do it like Cavett, Carson, Merv, Mike, Regis, warm, old school talk show style. Um Nothing too crazy and uh, to connect with all of us and connect us with the, everybody that's watching and just that enjoying what we're saying. Yeah, it's a, sort of an old school way of doing it with a modern vibe. And people have been saying we're bringing back the, uh, the lore start of conversations. So you are amazing. Um, what are some of those blessings and joys in your life? You mentioned many, Lucy, that continue to you know, forge you forward to do what you do so well to entertain all of us. I'm blessed with a lot of great people around me. I have to say that. I have an enormously intelligent, loving, compassionate support team, starting with Laura, you know, and my husband, Larry Luckenbill, and uh, Elizabeth Edwards, who has worked with us in our little company, sort of a one-man band for 30 years. It's crazy. Uh, and just a couple people who book me and manage me, David Williams, uh, manager, and Wayne Gemitter, who books all my concerts. And I I just don't have bad people around me. I have good people who care and are funny and are spiritual. You know, when I say spiritual, I mean, there's a c'est la vie about stuff that goes wrong and nobody takes it too seriously and nobody yells at the other person. That's not always true in our business. There's a lot of egos and there's a lot of anger and a lot of you know, bruised, whatever. And we don't function like that here. And and then I have uh, five amazing children. I have three of my own and their kids, Simon, Joe, and Kate, and two great stepsons, Nick and Ben. I'm I'm truly blessed. Lots of great friends, uh, as I mentioned before, down here in Palm Springs. I have more friends than I've ever had in my in my life anywhere else. And I've lived in Los Angeles and New York, New York City, and Westchester. Um, I don't know. I've, I think I've got some great uh, spirit guides, guardian angels, however you look at it, that uh, keep pointing me in the right direction and take, take care of me when I need taking care of. So I trust it. You know, I always I always ask, uh, you know, what am I supposed to think about this? Talk to me. And I get answers. So I'm going to just keep doing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep doing what you do so beautifully, my friend. Uh, I want to show you a couple of great comments coming in here. A wonderful show. Thank you, Crystal. And Joey says, fantastic show. So nice to meet you, Lucy. Thank you, Jim, for having Lucy on the show. We love it, Joey. Thank you for those great comments. And happy birthday early, they're saying. Best yes, wishes on your show. You. Sounds wonderful. Thank happy you. birthday early, Lucy. Enjoy your day and celebrate the warm and wonderful you. If you ever need some lovity, lovity. <laughs> down day, come stop by, my friend. Uh, uh, keep the home videos coming too. Uh, love to you and your family from Linda Tyler. 
Again, you're the best. Thanks for your wit, your wisdom, your your charm, your talent. Uh, absolutely love you and uh, spending this time with us. And especially, you know, we're in some crazy times. And I know, like you said, it we're coming off a really crazy, horrible time with yesterday and just the last couple of years have been up in the air and uh and here you are you know you've got your music you've got your your concerts you're just doing what you do and um we love it and i, I thank you so much for spending all this time with us you really are you're a treasure my friend you're a I treasure it, jim i appreciate the opportunity it was a lovely conversation and uh everybody just don't give up the ship even when right. you feel it sinking. That's right. <laughs> I hope the show met whatever expectations you had, my friend, and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you. Oh, I have indeed. Thank you again. And thanks to your audience. Lovely people. Nice to meet you all. Belovedies. Belovedies. <laughs> we'll keep the porch light on for you, my friend. You're welcome back anytime. And uh, good yeah. luck with the run of the concerts. They're selling out, folks. Uh, I'll mention it again where they can get the tickets. And okay. uh, you be well, my friend, okay? Thank you very much. Love Bye you. Now. Take care. Bye-bye now. Lucy Arnez on the Gym Master Show Live. A beautiful conversation, really. We thank her so very much for spending this time with us. And uh, we'll take a look at some of the amazing comments. You guys have been amazing throughout. Austin Field watching says, another wonderful show. Please subscribe for excellent content. Thank you very much. Appreciate those words. Uh, Maureen says, Lucy, I'm glad you got the job. Keep being awesome. Absolutely. I second that emotion. Harry all kinds of smiles. Uh, Greg is giving uh, cyber hugs to Lucy. Uh, Joey says, bye. Uh, Maggie, Maggie's Perry Music says, you are my new favorite person. Um, Harry Parrish says, thank you, Jim. Very Cavett. Yeah, I, uh, well, I always loved it, Cavett. And did you see the episode when Lucy was on <laughs> with her mother and Carol Burnett? Uh, that is epic. I believe you can see that on YouTube or I think the decades network has aired it. It really was a spectacular, uh, episode. Uh, Jane's watching a Sweden. She says, Lucy, you're now a lovety Merlin in Ontario, Canada says, thanks, Lucy. Love ya. Uh, Cullen field says, I enjoy the interview. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate that. You guys are the best with these comments coming in from around the world. Sherry Larson. Thank you for joining us, Lucy. Best wishes and all you do in the future. And uh, Carla in South America says, Jim, by the way, Lucy, you're a lovety now. Thank you both for this stunning show. It is our pleasure. We appreciate your watching and being with us. Uh, we love Lucy. Uh, yes. What a night. XXX. Uh, thanks, gang, for all these comments. Again, we're very interactive here at the Gym Master Show Live. I just love to interact like Lucy does with her audiences. Uh, I love to interact as well. Crystal says, please come back again, Lucy. Absolutely. And uh, thank you. Great conversation. Uh, this was fab. We love Lucy. Linda Tyler, uh, thank you, Lucy, for another fantastic chat. Thanks, Jim, for having her here on your show. Simply the best. The pleasure is all mine. Uh, Maureen says, this has been fabulous. I always wished you were my big sister, Lucy. I just love you. Hope to see you at the Purple Room sometime. Thank you very much. Some of the great comments. Yeah, Harry, George Burns always appears uh, every show, every episode. Would you believe we've done in the two years that we've been doing the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series, which is a mouthful, we're approaching 700 episodes of our series, and we always <laughs> we always uh, bring George in. Look up his walk on David Letterman with Julia Child on YouTube. I will do that. I will absolutely do that. That was uh, <laughs> for real. The same lipstick. Yes, and she was holding it. You are beautiful, Lucy. Smiles and smiles. It's 2.30 a.m. where you are there in Sweden. That's Jane. Uh, let's see more coming in. Such a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Jim and Lucy. Rihanna says, hi, Lucy. Watching from Hemet, California. Larry S. Klein is here. Lucy Arnaz is a mensch. She never fails 
at adulting. I love that, Larry. Any of you watching for the first time, we welcome you to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Friday Talk Show Series. We're here every day. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a like on our YouTube channel. This is a little like thumbs up icon there by this episode and all the episodes. Leave a comment too on the YouTube channel. We would love that. And uh, subscribe to Gym Masters TV. That's the channel where we house all these epic episodes with the amazing conversations, great entertainment, and more on our series where we're bringing back the lost art of conversation with extraordinary guests, live interaction with viewers watching from around the world, all of you, and lots of surprises. And we come at you live too. So anything can happen. So there's a red subscribe button there you see on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. Click it. There's no cost for that. Uh, that just lets us know that you're enjoying what we do and you appreciate everything we do here at the Gym Masters Show Live. Thanks for all these great comments, gang. Really amazing. Great conversation, Jim. You've done good again. Thank you very much. I still love that. Um, you're, you're so great, Maureen. You, you're, you're so kind with your comments. And uh, Maggie Perry's music says, still love you too, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> you love Lucy and Jim. I appreciate that. And uh, Christine Clifton is here. Jim, I enjoyed all the stories Lucy shared. I love her work, her bubbly personality, her contagious energy. She's real and real fun. She looks fabulous and she's amazing. Best wishes to lovely Lucy. Charlene Lee, thank you very much. And Charlene, I think you also did a super sticker earlier. Um, we'd have to scroll way back, but thank you for the super sticker that you did. Uh, that was very kind of you in support of what we do here, the Gym Masters Show Live series. There's so many comments here, and we really, really appreciate them all. Greg says uh, Lucy was looking great, and uh, Linda says you deserve to pick and choose, Lucy. That is amazing for you. I love that. And um, we'll show a couple more on here again. Greg says Jim and Lucy, this is lovely. Thank you. You're very welcome, Greg, and we love Lucy. Absolutely. We sure do. And any of you that are new to our show, thanks for joining us. I hope you'll be with us again. We're here just about every single day live on our YouTube channel. I could listen to Lucy for hours. Absolutely. Yeah, so can I. She really is amazing. Um, and Linda would love to see Lucy perform someday live. Absolutely. Go to luciones.com. You can learn more uh, about the upcoming concerts that are happening as well. And Scotland. Greg is watching in Scotland. Sends a hug to everybody from Scotland. Thank you very much. We appreciate that, Greg. So nice to have you here. And let's see. So many comments. Of course, we couldn't get to all of them only because there were so, so many. But... Uh, we acknowledge them all. We thank you for all of the comments. This is what it's like on the Gym Master Show Live. You know, we get all these wonderful comments and uh, we thank you very much. There it is. There's the Charlene Lee super sticker. Thank you very much, Charlene. We thank you for that. So kind of you to do that earlier. And Maureen also did a uh, super sticker with her fabulous comment uh, as well, which we really appreciate. Very kind of you to do that as well, Maureen. Uh, we had Paul there in Arizona, one of our longtime lovely viewers. And there it is. Thank you very much, Maureen. We want to just uh, note that and thank you for that as well. Very kind of you. I believe I read that on the air to Lucy as well. And she was, uh, she was touched by that. And uh, really, really nice. More comments coming in here. And uh, have a wonderful night, Jim and Lovities. Thank you very much as well from Crystal. Thanks, Jim. Another great night. Hope you and the Lovities have a great night. Hugs and love to all to you as well. That's Mona watching in Arizona live. Uh, not, not Arizona, in NOLA. That's New Orleans, Louisiana. Yeah, Maureen watches in Arizona. Kathleen Walker in New York City. Thanks for another great show, Jim. It was nice meeting Lucy. Have a great night. Good night, all. Absolutely. She is amazing. And uh, we love Lucy. Absolutely. What a night. Thanks, Jim, from Carla in Brazil, South America. You guys are the best. Thanks for all these great comments. Uh, we're just scroll, scrolling through a few here. Um, 
you know, we trying not to miss any because there's lots of them built up here. Sometimes it allows us to scroll back a little bit. And um, you guys were loving some of the photos that we were showing that uh, we put together and assembled. Uh, let's see if we can show some of the again. Yeah, this is uh, Lucy and I at an event, which was uh, fabulous. She, again, she is absolutely amazing. And with uh, there's Larry, her husband, right next to her in the white shirt, and Sean and uh, Teresa and David Friedman, of course, you know, our dear friend. And this was after Pippin on uh, in New York City, Broadway. I still love that one. That's one of my personal faves. <laughs> and of course, we talked about her iconic parents, Lucio Ball and Desi Arnaz. There she is with her husband. Another iconic and epic actor and writer-producer, Lawrence Luckenbell. They're your favorites, of course, Lucy and Desi and uh, Ethel and Fred with Little Ricky, Desi Arnaz, Lucy Ball, and uh, Keith Thibodeau, and Vivian Vance, William Frawley. And, of course, Lucy Ball with Desi, Jr., and Lucy. The iconic I Love Lucy show, Need I Say More? Here's Lucy. Gail Gordon in that shot as well with... Uh, Lucio Ball and Lucy Arnaz and Desi Arnaz Jr. TV Guide cover. Absolutely. There is the poster for the tour, for the concerts. I got the job. Songs from my musical past. Musical director Ron Abel with the incredible Lucy Arnaz. Some more shows, photos here. This is a recent one, too. You will enjoy. You will thoroughly enjoy. And, of course, we talked about their playing our song. The Redo, 40 Years Later, by one and only Pippin. You guys were talking about Lucy and Desi, the Amy Poehler version, and then the Aaron Sorkin version with being the Ricardos. Yes, the long-lost tapes. Let's talk to Lucy. Lucy Ball. That great shot. This from uh, Laura Johansson. Beautiful shot of uh, Lucy recently at one of the concerts. I think she uh, she had mentioned uh, in California, and it was wonderful having her here, wasn't it? Really, really a delight. We like to always have a little chat after the guest leaves, and just sort of wrap th things up neatly. Extraordinary actress, singer, Emmy winning producer Lucy Ball and Desi Arnaz's daughter. She's carved out her own niche. She's very talented, warm, funny, affable, and all the rest. I can go on all night about uh, how terrific she is. Uh, having, I know her personally, and I can tell you that she is really the real deal. That's one of the things that I was trying to stress tonight. She is the real deal. So when you see her perform, I mean, you've seen her on television. You've seen her in movies. You've seen her you know, on, on the, in theater productions. But when you see her in her show, She's the real deal. You, you, it's like you're with a friend. You know what I mean? And in a way, you are. You've known her for years. You've followed her for years. And she's very open and authentic, as you can see and hear on this episode of the Jim Masters Show. So uh, we encourage you to check out. Go to LucyArnez.com to learn more. Now, for those of you in the New York area, here's sort of like a direct link to uh, 54 Below to Feinstein's in New York City, where the uh, tickets are... Uh, either already on sale or going to be on sale. Check it out. They're going to go fast because uh, of the shows she's done this far, every single one sells out. Every single one sells out. And it's easy to see why. It's Lucy. And everybody loves what she does. And uh, they connect with her. And uh, good stuff, huh? Really cool stuff. And maybe you learned a few things, too, about our very special guest, Lucy Arnaz, uh, that you didn't know. That's cool. We love to do that on the Gym Master Show Live as well. Some great pictures. Thanks for sharing. My pleasure. She doesn't take a bad photo, but neither do you, Jim. Have a great rest of your day and night, my lovely family. Thank you very much. This was a very special show. Really, really very, very special show. And you can see it again in our archives, gang. If you would like to see this episode again or any of our episodes over... 700 or almost 700 episodes of the Jim Master Show Live. Uh, 
We had Michael Lernard on recently, who played Olivia Walton in The Waltons. We had legendary actress Sally Kirkland with us recently. We had the incomparable Joanna Gleason with us recently. She was extraordinary. Um, the list goes on and on and on. Scroll through our archives on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, and you can see uh, some of the amazing episodes that uh, we have done. And uh, really, really epic. So you, you never miss anything because we archive everything here on our show. So you have an opportunity to see it again. If you ever miss an episode, just uh, check it out here on our channel. And uh, it's available 24-7, 365. A lot of you do like to binge watch our series. And we love that. And leave a comment. Drop a comment on the YouTube channel as well. And we salute all of you for watching uh, in the I Love Lucy official mug. There's a little coffee in here, but by now this coffee is uh, iced coffee. We toast to all of you. We have a wonderful audience that watches and supports the Gym Master Show live series. And uh, whether you're watching live or you're watching this later in the archives, we thank you so very much for being with us. We're sort of bringing back the lost art of conversation in that Cavett Carson style um, with a modern vibe for today. Thank you, Christine. We appreciate that. And uh, you're in uh, New York City right now, heading back home to North Carolina. Safe travels for you, from me and all the Lovities. This was a wonderful conversation with Lucy. Lovity hugs. And uh, thank you as well to you. And Carla watching in Brazil. So cool to see you here as well. And uh, we welcome you to come back. Gang, you know, we always have a good time on this show, don't we? It's really amazing what we ha what we do on the show. I want to let you know that tomorrow we've got some really epic guests. We have the stars and the creators of the new sitcom, Ben and Tony. Yes, Marianne Alda, Donald Watson, Dominic Oliver, and many others. Cast and crew are going to be with us tomorrow live at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on the Gym Master Show live. And we love it. That's tomorrow. And again, many, many more episodes and guests and lovely coming your way here. Love the mug, Jim. Thank you very much. <laughs> which which uh, mug? This one or the Lucy mug? <laughs> Lucy and Desi mug. <laughs> I know which one you're talking about. Lucy and Desi. All right. Um, yes, get some rest. It's been a long day. I was on two TV shoots today up in Massachusetts, and it was a long day. I just got in maybe only about 45 minutes. I got in the door here only about 45 minutes before we had to go live. So I was up late. I've actually, I've been up all night. I actually haven't gone to bed yet since yesterday. All right. <laughs> uh, we had dinner. We ate. But I haven't gone to bed yet because I knew that I had the two television shoots back to back in the Boston area today. So I was going to be away. So we wanted to make sure we had everything all lined up neatly and nicely for when Lucy graced us with her presence, uh, Lucy Onez, today on the show. So we worked way into the wee hours of lol yesterday, last night, into the morning so we can present a, a nice episode for Lucy and for you. So didn't go to bed yet. <laughs> I'm going to drop like a fly tonight, I'm sure. <laughs> Three radio shows to host and then we tomorrow and then we have uh, the guests, uh, the stars and creators of the, sick, the new sitcom, Ben and Tony. They're coming up. And lots more for all of you here on the Gym Master Show Live series. You guys are the best. Go to bed, crazy man. I know. I know, I know. Only the best for you guys, I tell you. All right, a couple more comments. Go to bed. The Lovities are telling me to go to bed. Yes, we will do that. We will do that. We will uh, We will plop right down and, uh, you know, just go into La La Land. If you enjoyed this episode, give it a like on our YouTube channel. We'd appreciate that. And uh, drop a comment and all the rest, all the rest. Crystal says, uh, we thank you, Jim, for all you do. Yes, get some rest. We shall do that. Go to bed. Relax. <laughs> we will do that. <laughs> you guys are the best. Thanks for being with us one more time. We thank our extraordinary guest, the one and only Lucy Arnaz, for joining us here on the Gym Masters Show. 
tell everybody you know about our show. Spread the lovity. Invite folks to tune in, to watch, to subscribe to our channel, and enjoy what we're doing here, bringing you all these great episodes. Uh, we don't say goodbye here. We just say see you later. We say sayonara, cheers, ciao, uh, avida zane, <laughs> hasta la vista. What else do we say? Um, I think that's about it, right? I think we got them all in there. Shalom. Uh, so we don't say goodbye. We just say see you later because we'll be back with more shows for all of you. Mona says, get some rest, Jim. You still look great, even with no sleep, LOL. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Check back an hour from now. Maybe uh, I won't so much. I'll be uh, sleeping. <laughs> You're watching the Jim Masters Show, and this is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, gang. We love you all. Be good to one another. Take care of one another. Thanks for joining us on this episode. And uh, as long as you're out there spreading the sunshine and the levity, we'll continue to present great episodes like this for all of you and you and you and you, as we always say on our show. Can't believe it. Uh, two years of this series and almost 700 episodes we've done. Thank you, Charlene Lee. We love you as well. Um, it's been and continues to be epic. All right. Take care. Be well. And we'll see you on the next, next uh, episode of our series, right? <laughs> I'll be here if you're here. You take care. Jim Masters saying thanks for being with us. We love you all. Same for me. No sleep today. Get rest and sleep. See you all soon. Yes, we shall do that. But that's for the live audience. But for those of you who are not watching this live, you're watching this like tomorrow or six months from now. Stay right here. Another great episode of our series, The Gym Master Show, comes up just for you on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. All right. I think it's officially a wrap. We had a good time with you guys. Thanks for being with us. And thanks for all the passion, enthusiasm, all the comments, all the wonderful words. Lucy saw it all. I saw it all. And we thank you. Let's keep it going. We love you all. And we'll see you again soon. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>